So my first clue that I put it together wrong was that the headphone jack wasn't quite lined up and I feel like it's a higher quality kit than to have that sort of thing be just how it is. And yet I went ahead, tried to plug it up and it didn't turn on and added all this up and it seemed to me that maybe one of the pins was out of alignment when I put it together. So I checked, I did that. I'm going to go back, fix what I messed up, and hopefully it'll power up. See you in a sec. Welcome back to Undulations. So, sometimes doing a YouTube channel, I feel like you can get imposter syndrome, where in the intro, I managed to freak up building this thing, and then I also was playing around with the arpeggiator and trying to do chords on here, which, as we'll see in a little bit, you can't do. So. Anyway, I've taken my time, wrapped my head around it, and I feel like it is a cool, tiny synthesizer that you can get some really big sounds out of. So this is the Korg NTS-1 Digital Synthesizer. It costs $109, so it's a pretty good deal, I would say, for the things that you could get. It comes as a kit, there's no soldering. It's kind of like putting together a little Lego kit. It comes with a little screwdriver, and uh, basically that's all you need to put it together. I followed the paper manual instructions, but there's also a video that you get a link to. That might be a good way to go as well. So just a sort of overhead view of it, there's a nice LED display that gives a lot of feedback in terms of what you're doing, what parameters you're trying to change with these three knobs. There are different modes that you set on here, like the oscillator, the filter, the envelope, a uh, modulation effect, a delay effect, and a reverb effect. And there's also an arpeggiator button, and you control the whole thing through this little touch strip uh, I've gotten used to it, and I feel like I like it after just a few days of playing around with it. Um, in terms of other connectivity, your only audio out is through the headphone jack there, and uh, then on the back you've got a volume control. There's actually a speaker on board here, so that's cool. Can you hear that? And then there's a USB socket, and that turns out to be very important because it's not just a way to uh, power it or go mobile with a portable power supply. It's also how you connect the NTS-1 to other things for a lot of different purposes. It's how you update it. At the end of the video, I want to talk more about the open architecture for both the software and the hardware of this. And the USB port also allows you to control the NTS-1 remotely with MIDI signals. Uh, so for example, notes and parameters can be changed using something like Ableton Live or some other DAW on your computer. And I think there are also apps on your phone or a tablet that could be used to control this thing as well. I have a little clip of controlling the NTS-1 with Ableton Live. Take a look. Now, 
the next port on the back is the MIDI input port. And this is just a TRS 3.5 millimeter port. So it's basically an aux port, but for MIDI. And on certain things like the Korg SQ1, for example, you can just hook things up with an audio cable and that will go fine. For other MIDI controllers, you're gonna have to use this thing called a breakout cable. So it's a little thing like this that goes from the uh, audio jack to the five pin MIDI cable. And there are just different flavors of these. So like this is an arterial one that I'll use in a little bit with the beat step. Uh, this is a cork one that I have here. And so you just kind of have to play around with the different types and uh, hopefully the gear that you've bought comes with it. This actually, the NTS one didn't come with a breakout cable. So I've got one from, I think, I guess the SQ1 and also from Little Bits, I think. But anyway, this works. And uh, so for the key step here, it sounds like this. I'm gonna play it out of the built-in speaker on the NTS-1. So if you don't like the idea of playing on a little tiny keyboard like this, Something like a key step is nice because it's more full sized and you've got pitch bend with it and also sequencer arpeggiator built into this thing. So you're gonna probably find that by hooking other things up to the NTS-1, you'll be able to get more out of it. It's just a question of what, maybe some gear that you already have, uh, maybe something like the SQ-1. I feel like that this guy is almost like the perfect companion for the NTS-1 and the SQ-1 is not very expensive. I did a little clip of this, check it out. Now, before we talk about the rest of these ports on the back of the synth, I think it's a good idea to just give some context about how it's set up and how you control the sound with it. Obviously, you've got node input here with the uh, touch strip, but then there are also these mode settings. So you can press the oscillator button and it'll give you a way to select oscillators with this first knob and then way to change the parameters for that oscillator with the other two knobs. And that's kind of just the way the whole thing is set up where the, uh, you do the same sort of thing with the filter, choose the filter type, choose the cutoff frequency, choose the resonance, and then the same goes for the envelope, set the type, do the parameter settings, and there are quite a few settings. The oscillator, I think there are five for that, uh, so square wave, saw wave, that sort of thing. Uh, there's also a user one that I'll talk more about in a bit. Um, then the filter, you've got a couple of different types of low pass, a couple of different types of high pass, and then the envelope, you've got some various envelope structures. So then for the effects, you've got three effects, the mod effect, I guess that's modulation, delay, and reverb. And you can have any or all of them on. And so it's not like you have to choose one or the other, but you do choose one effect out of the modulation uh, so it'd be like you could have a chorus or you could have a flanger, but you can't have both. There's also an ensemble and a phaser for the mod. And then 
the delay, think of that as more choosing the type. So there's a stereo delay, which is really nice. There's a mono delay. Uh, there's also a uh, ping pong and a um, tape delay as well. So some cool settings there. Then on the reverb, that's just uh, sort of what you might think, where there'd be a hall, re hall reverb, um, plate reverb. Uh, I think there are a couple of others like space and submarine. And so this is a lot of stuff for setting up the sounds. And uh, then finally over here, there's an ARP button. So that lets you set up the arpeggiator. I'll try to play something. Maybe you can hear it on the lab mic. And so that's latchable, and uh, you can choose different types of arpeggiation, so up, down, random, and a lot of other uh, different possibilities. You can set the tempo for that, and we'll get to synchronization in a minute, but as soon as you hook something else up, instead of choosing like a 120 BPM tempo, you start to choose, um, if, if you're being synced from another unit, you uh, get to choose whether you want to be on a 16th note or a 32nd or whatever. And uh, so it, I think that the arpeggiator is quite nice. The thing that I was doing that was totally wrong, though, was playing a chord like that. You can't do that. This is just a single input point. And so the way that Cork solves that uh, to give meaningful arpeggios is to let you using these buttons so then the art button becomes sort of a shift key and you can select whether you want to have a major arpeggio or minor suspended augmented uh, there, there are quite a few things to choose from on that and then you can also using the knobs choose how many notes are going to be in the arpeggiation so I feel like the whole interface is quite nice very flexible, and don't want to forget that there are also a few low frequency oscillators tucked in here that let you control things like the, uh, um, one of the parameters is a shape parameter on the oscillator, so you can do a low frequency oscillation of that. You can also control pitch with the LFO. And then there's a second LFO that's to be used for controlling the uh, filter. So you can sweep the filter and control the time of that, the depth of that. And then uh, same thing for the envelope that allows you to do a third uh, LFO to get a tremolo effect. So there's a lot of sound design that you can do on the NTS-1. And kind of held off about doing a full-blown tutorial on this little synth because I feel like that with the manual and just sort of clicking around and fiddling with the parameters that you can learn a lot about how it works and you know there's really just no substitute for sitting and messing around with it. It's just that type of thing where it's intuitive, well-designed, and I think hands-on is the way to go with this thing. Now, lest I forget, I should also say that in terms of MIDI control, the Arturia Beat Step is yet again a nice choice for controlling the NTS-1. And it's because with the reverb, the delay, it's kind of set up for arpeggios, sequences. It's got the built-in ARP thing, so it all sort of makes sense, but with the beat step, you can very easily sort of go and do your own arpeggios, your own sequences. It's a lot more uh, capable in that regard. And then you can also code things up to where the, the uh, and it's not hard, you just use the Arturia editor to make things so that the knobs on here control the parameters on here. And so it's a really powerful combo to get a lot out of the NTS-1. So uh, I did a little clip of that. Take a look.
So one last thing about MIDI. I feel like that for some of you, this could be your first hardware synthesizer, and uh, maybe you've worked around with a DAW, maybe you have some MIDI controllers, something like a Novation Launchpad or some other type of keyboard controller. Bear in mind that by getting a MIDI host box, and these are not that expensive, you can hook things up to where that you can play on your MIDI controller and get that signal into the NTS-1. Certainly the notes, I think probably the uh, uh, parameter values as well. I haven't actually done that, but pretty confident that that would be a good way to go. Okay, so that's all for MIDI, and uh, that leaves a few ports here on the back. The sync in and out, so that's a synchronization signal, and then the audio input. And when I was uh, modifying my voice with the reverb and delay at the beginning of the video, I did that through the audio input. And in some ways, I would say that the audio input is one of the most powerful features of the NTS-1 because not only can you use it as a synthesizer, you can use it as an effects box. And so if you're like a guitar person and wanted to run your guitar through here, it's very possible. I've got a cigar box guitar and noodled around on it a little bit. Take a look at what I came up with. Now, I feel like we're getting down to what I think of as the real deal on the NTS-1, and that's using a combination of synchronization and external audio processing. And so, for example, that could be with a Volca, or in the first case I'm gonna show, I'm gonna use a PO32 tonic pocket operator for drums that are gonna get processed through the audio effects chain and so that's going to be some delay and reverb so that's cool but then i'm also using the tonics sync signal to synchronize the arpeggio on the nts1 so it's a lot of stuff that is going on together it's nice but before we see that i want to talk a little bit about how the audio processing is done there's a, a nice uh, block diagram in the manual and Turns out in the global parameter settings, you can choose how you route your audio input. You can have it go through the mod effect, delay and reverb, and then out. You can have it do just delay and reverb. You can have it do just reverb, or you can have it go through clean. And so it just becomes sort of a mixer there. Now, one thing that you can notice from this diagram, I know you probably can't see it, but there is no option to route it through the filter. So the external audio does not go through the filter on the NTS-1. And I'm not sure of the design choice of why that would be, but I think I remember the original Monotron had uh, the audio going through the filter, so it might be nice to have. And I would say don't give up hope on that happening because maybe potentially an update or as we'll talk about in a second, the user extensions that can be added to the NTS-1. And so it might be that by using a user effect, you can put a filter into the effects chain for external audio. All that said, check this out with the PO32. So the next thing that I tried to pair with the NTS-1 was the Basel Castle. And 
My original thinking was to try to use the sync signal to do the LFO reset on the castle to get kind of some sort of synchronization going. I got sidetracked. I made this. And then later I actually went back and did the sync thing, which I thought turned out pretty cool. Now, one of the last things I want to show in this video is sort of a bonus PO32 clip. And in this one, I just had the synchronization set up wrong. Instead of having a sync signal, I just had an audio signal into the sync input on the NTS-1. And this kind of gives me an idea of the power of the brain in the NTS-1. I think it is quite powerful and it's picking up a lot of the audio signal and just trying to make the arpeggiator go in sync with that. So it turns out to be quite unsynchronized. And I uh, think when you add in the reverb delay, that turned out kind of pretty. Now, here's something that I've really been wanting to talk about in this video, and that is the openness of the NTS-1 architecture. It reminds me a lot of the organelle for Critter and Guitari, where basically people make patches, post them up on the internet, and you can download them, put them into the organelle, and there's just no end to it. You're adding and changing what this little digital synthesizer can do, and I think that's the same intent from Korg on the NTS-1. Now, just to give a rundown on that, there is a way that you can apparently use a, uh, I think it's the log SDK. So if you're a coder, you can make your own effects, make your own oscillator types, and uh, seems like there's a lot of room for that in here. It was maybe, I think, 16 custom oscillators, eight custom reverbs, eight custom delays. So I think you can really load this thing up. But if that's not your bag, and I'm not saying that I'm likely to do that, uh, there's another way, which is just using things that other people have done. And so 
there's a piece of software on the Cork site called the Librarian that apparently lets you add uh, different types of oscillators and effects to this thing. So if any of you have done that, please make sure to leave a comment. But I do intend to look into that. And I uh, feel like that at the very least, let's make sure to update our NTS-1s as time passes because I wouldn't be surprised if that added some new oscillators and effects as well. So that would be cool. Now, there are also some hardware modifications that you can uh, do. There were a couple given there where you just basically turn this into a stomp box. And there was another one where you add a sequencer, it was a circular sequencer that just sort of replaces this front panel. It seems like a lot of cool things that can be happening around the NTS-1. So with that in mind, I'm going to close this video out with another quark thing. One of my favorites is Little Bits. I haven't done this yet, but I'm just hoping that it's going to be something that turns out pretty cool. I'm going to hook up some Little Bits to the NTS-1, see what I can come up with. So I appreciate everybody watching, and I will see you in the next one.